Welcome back. In our last session, we looked at the final of the seven signs that constitutes the first part of the gospel, the raising of Lazarus. We saw that Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus, manifest two common reactions in the face of the death of a loved one, a deep faith in God and an anger at God. We examined the narration of the critical actual miracle and looked at the reaction of the onlookers to that miracle. In our current session, we bring to a conclusion the Book of Signs and begin to look at the second major part of John's Gospel, the Book of Glory. In particular, we shall look at the final days of Jesus' public ministry, as they're narrated in the twelfth chapter of John. Two narratives stand out for our attention the plot by the Sanhedrin against Lazarus, and the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem to begin the final week of his life. The Book of Glory, the second part of the Gospel, begins with chapter 13 and the narrative of the Last Supper. The Last Supper in John consists of chapters 13 through 17, most of which comprise a lengthy discourse of Jesus to his disciples. Prior to that discourse, however, Jesus washes the feet of his disciples and announces who his betrayer will be. The major part of the discourse will be our topic for the next two sessions. The twelfth chapter of the Gospel of John consists of four units, two of which we will examine. First is the anointing at Bethany that we referred to in the preceding unit. In this unit, the sisters of Lazarus are prominent. Martha is serving, while Mary washes the feet of Jesus and dries them with her hair. This is followed by the narrative of the plot to kill Lazarus, which leads to the entry narrative of Jesus into Jerusalem. Then, once he's in Jerusalem, Jesus announces the arrival of the hour which many see as the Johannine version of the narrative in Gethsemane that's found in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As a result of word traveling like wildfire about Jesus bringing Lazarus back to life, people are flocking to see Jesus. But not only Jesus, but also Lazarus. So the authorities hatch a plan to put Lazarus to death, because many Jews were beginning to follow Jesus. This narrative begins with what has come to be a common linking word in John's Gospel. Therefore, a great crowd from the Jews learned that Jesus was there. Now given the fact that Jesus hasn't moved, more than likely there refers to Bethany the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. As a result, they came to the home, not only to see Jesus, but to see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Perhaps they wanted to verify that Lazarus was truly living. There is a reaction from the authorities. The chief priest took counsel in order that they might also kill Lazarus. At the end of the narrative of the raising, last, last session, they took, they took counsel to kill Jesus at 1153. The reason for this second murder plot is that seemingly as a result of the raising of Lazarus, many Jews were departing from Judaism and believing in Jesus. Now, many interpreters see that this is a passing thing rather than a solid act of faith in Jesus. As a result, John casts the excitement that was generated by the raising of Lazarus as a backdrop against which he narrates Jesus' final entry into the city of Jerusalem. 
utilizing the temporal reference that we saw significantly in the first chapter on the next day. The entry narrative is introduced. Then a great crowd is introduced as coming to the feast. In 1155, the feast has been identified as Passover. They heard that Jesus was going to be in Jerusalem. So they took branches, fronds of palms, and went to meet him. The palms traditionally have been a sign of homage to a victor. In the first book of Maccabees, the people of Jerusalem gather palm branches to process, taking possession of Jerusalem after Simon the Maccabee conquered it in 142 BCE. As a result of this, the palm branch, which is significant in the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles also, has taken on a nationalistic aura. Thus, the washing, the the waving of palm branches to greet Jesus may be a sign of their nationalistic hopes that Jesus was the messianic liberator arriving to free them from Rome. Accompanying the palm was the cry. Hosanna, which in Hebrew was Hoshia Na, meaning please save. This is a reference to the 118th Psalm, in particular verse 25 of that Psalm. Verse 26, which follows, says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. This section of Psalm 118 is a dialogue between the people lining the walls of Jerusalem and the entourage of the victorious king arriving at the gates of the city. Contrary to the accounts in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus finds a donkey, rather than sending the disciples to fetch it. And then he sits on it, fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, which then the writer cites, Do not fear, daughter Zion, Behold, your king is coming, seated on the foal of an ass. Even though he does not cite the entire of Zechariah 9.9, it's clear that it's cited to counter the common messianic expectation of the day. Jesus is not the victorious, brash Messiah expected by the people. Rather, he's the humble, peaceful Messiah riding a donkey, entering Jerusalem, in contrast to the leader who rides a war horse. Kostenberger notes, Jesus' choice of a donkey invokes prophetic imagery of a king coming in peace, which contrasts sharply with the notions of a political warrior messiah. Here is a map of the city of Jerusalem. The route of the entry is toward the upper right. To the east, right of Gethsemane, is the town of Bethphage, where traditionally the procession began coming down the Mount of Olives, past Gethsemane, following that road across the Kidron Valley to the Golden Gate of the Wall of Jerusalem, where Jesus entered the temple precincts. This is a picture of Jesus on the donkey processing into Jerusalem. It's located in the church at Bethphage. Finally, we have a rock that many since Crusader times have felt was the mounting stone of Christ, that is, the stone he used to mount the donkey. However, looking at the size of the stone, I think Murphy O'Connor is right when he remarks that the Crusaders were, quote, forgetting that a Palestinian donkey was in no way comparable to their huge battle chargers, unquote. The focus shifts to the disciples and their reaction to what was happening. The language is similar to the reaction of the disciples to the incident of the buyers and the sellers in the, uh, in the temple that we saw in chapter 2. 
John tells us that at first the disciples did not understand these things. But after the resurrection, when Jesus was glorified, they remembered two things. First, they remembered that these things were written about him, and second, they remembered that they did these things to him. Beasley Murray notes that it took the experience of the Paschal Mystery, the death and resurrection, for the disciples to come to a correct understanding of what Jesus' Messiahship meant, and thus what this entrance into Jerusalem meant. He says then, after the death and resurrection, it was that they grasped the nature of the kingship of Jesus, as he himself had revealed it. The king of peace and salvation brought to the world the kingdom of peace and salvation, precisely through his dying and rising. In addition to the disciples, the crowd was present. This crowd is then specified as the same as had witnessed Jesus call Lazarus out from the tomb and raise him from the dead in the preceding chapter. This crowd bears witness. There seemingly is yet another crowd, however, that joins this entourage, a crowd who did not witness the Lazarus event, but had heard about it. As a result, the authorities say, See, you're not gaining anything. The whole world has gone after him. This superlative must refer to the multiple groups that have joined Jesus in his entry. Several commentators see this as a comment that fits the time of Jesus, but also the time of the gospel. They, the Pharisees, could not frustrate Jesus' mission and could not frustrate the mission of the followers, of his followers, at the time of the gospel. In fact, authorities have not been able to frustrate that mission to this very day. We now move from the public ministry of Jesus to the final meal of Jesus with his followers, the Last Supper. In John's Gospel, that narrative comprises over half the text, chapters 13 to 17, of the second part of the Gospel, known as the Book of Glory. The Last Supper narrative can be subdivided as follows. The narrative of the washing of the feet from 13, 1 to 30. Then the main part of the discourse which follows, chapters 1331 to 1633. That can be further subdivided into 1331 to 38, the New Commandment, 14, 1 to 31, the discourse, pre the discourse proper, 15, 1 to 17, an independent discourse on the vine and branches, 15, 18, 6, 15, 18 to 16, 4a, another independent discourse, and 16, 4b to 33, the remainder of the discourse proper. Finally, the discourse closes with what is known as the priestly prayer of Jesus, 17, 1 to 26. The Johannine Last Supper narrative is quite different from the Last Supper narratives of the other Gospels. Primarily, it does not contain a narrative of the institution of the Eucharist. John, as we saw, has presented his Eucharistic theology in the Bread of Life discourse in chapter 6. Rather, John has a narrative which exemplifies what service is about, the service he has called his, his disciples to, the washing of the feet. The site that commemorates the events of this narrative is known today as the Room of the Last Supper, or the Chinaculum, which comes from the Latin word for supper, chena. 
It's located on the second floor of a building which houses the Tomb of David on the lower floor. The general opinion of scholars and architectural, ex architectural experts is that the present room does not date back to the time of Christ, but rather to the 13th or 14th century to the time of the Mamluk Turks who occupied the Holy Land, such as you can see in this architecture. This is confirmed by the architecture of the room, as can be seen from these photographs. There's one more point of discussion before we get to a discussion of the narrative. That's the fact that there's a discrepancy on whether the Last Supper was actually a Passover meal. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's clear that the Last Supper was a Passover meal. But in John, that's not so clear. In fact, when the Jews approached Pilate in the Passion narrative, we're told that they could not enter the Praetorium lest they should be defiled and unable to eat the Passover, which would imply that the meal was on the night of the crucifixion. In this diagram, the lines that bisect the horizontal line are the Roman reckoning of time from midnight to midnight. The lines that do not bisect the horizontal line are the Jewish reckoning from sundown to sundown. Thus, the, the Johannine chronology would be as follows, with the 15th of Nisan, the beginning of Passover, beginning at sundown on Friday. What we know for sure is that the Last Supper took place on Thursday evening and the crucifixion in the early afternoon of the next day, Friday. Overlay the synoptic chronology on that and we see that the Last Supper began at sundown on the 15th of Nisan in the Synoptics, and thus was a Passover meal. But it began at sundown on the 14th of Nisan and John, and thus it was not. The question can then be asked, if it wasn't a Passover, what was it? Many see it as a ritual meal celebrating fellowship, what was known as the Chavura, in John's Gospel, given Jesus' instructions and aids for life without him, a Kavura setting would make sense. The narrative of the foot washing begins with a temporal reference that it's just before Passover. Recall that this is the third Passover recorded in John's Gospel. But then the narrator continues, noting that this is a special Passover. Jesus knew that his hour, which has been mentioned throughout the Gospel beginning at chapter 2, has come. The hour was the point at which Jesus completed his mission on earth and departed from this world to the Father. Then the relationship between Jesus and his disciples is mentioned. He loved his own. This is the referent used here for his disciples, his own. He loved them to the end. Ritterboss speaks of the love here as a love to the last breath, or as we would put it, a love to his dying, his last dying breath. Immediately, the dark side of the events to follow is introduced. During their supper, the devil cast it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, who was described as the son of Simon Iscariot and the one who would betray or hand over Jesus to the authorities. Maloney sees a different way to interpret the text. He translated, translates it, the devil made up his mind that Judas betray. In either case, it's the devil who's behind the action. Then Jesus' awareness of his hour had come is repeated with two significant changes. Jesus knew, one, that the Father had given him all things, or given all things into his hands, 
that is, he was doing the will of the Father. And two, he had come from God and was going to God. That he had the approbation of God as God's messenger. With that background, Jesus acts. He rose from the supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, with which he girded himself, and then poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. This series of verbs describes what is the task of the most menial slave in a household, but it was something quite greater. Kostenberger notes that Jesus' act of humility is as unnecessary as it is stunning and is simultaneously a display of love a symbol of saving cleansing, and a model of Christian conduct. Then he wipes the feet of the disciples with the towel around his waist. It is noted that this action happens in silence, with no explanation. As a result, it most likely startled the disciples who questioned in their minds, what is he doing? The first hint of an explanation of what's going on comes when Jesus reaches Simon Peter, who, as usual, is outspoken. He breaks the silence of the moment with a question. Lord, Kuria, are you going to wash my feet? The question highlights the pronouns you and my. Peter is the apprentice to Jesus. And as such, he will not allow the master to wash his feet. Jesus' response is quick and simple. What I do, you do not understand just now. But you will after these things. Scholars have questioned just what the moment of understanding will, what mo the moment of, when the moment of understanding will come. At the end of the action of the washing of the feet, after the resurrection at Easter, once the Spirit is descended at Pentecost? Most agree that the full meaning of what's happening does not come until Pentecost. Peter is unmoved by Jesus' comment. He reiterates, You shall never wash my feet. He is emphatically clear in the Greek. You will not wash my feet into eternity, ace ton Iona. But Jesus comes back with a statement that reveals the deep significance of what's happening. If I do not wash you, you will have no part in me. This is a third class or an anticipated or assured future condition. In other words, all that grammar means Jesus says if Peter sticks to his resolve and prohibits Jesus washing his feet, he will not share or have a place in the eternal kingdom. So Peter gets the message, but again is overly exuberant in saying, not my feet only, but also my hand and my head, my hands and my head. Peter wants a part in Jesus, but not just a part as big a part as possible. So wash everything. Jesus calms him down, noting that the one who has bathed, that is totally immersed themselves in a bath, does not need to wash, that is have a partial washing with water, except the feet. The whole is clean. In Greek, the word luo and nipto. All the disciples are clean. That is washed. But then Jesus makes a rather curious addition. But not all. Many see that as a reference to the betrayer who has been mentioned, Judas Iscariot. Jesus 
Then the editor clears up what that oblique comment was all about in typical Johannine editorial style. For he knew the one betraying him. On account of this, he said, not all are clean. There's the editorial two by four again. Completed the action of washing the feet, or washing the disciples' feet, Jesus puts his garment back on and reclines again at table. Then he asks the pertinent question, Do you know what I have done for you? Since there is no answer, Jesus explains, You call me teacher and Lord referring to the titles that the disciples have used thus far in addressing Jesus. You are correct, he says, for so indeed I am. This much they get. But now comes the meaning of what just happened. If I, therefore, the teacher and Lord, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. We have here another condition, this time a real condition. Jesus has just washed their feet, so they are to do the same to each other. Rank means nothing. Then Jesus continues, I have given you an example. The Greek word there, hypodegma, means primarily example, but, but it also can mean a pattern or a model. Here, a model of humility. That example is then re reiterated, that as I have done to you, you also should do. The argument that Jesus uses here is one that we've seen before. It's a typical form of rabbinic argument known as Kalva Homer. It's the argument of a greater to a lesser. If Jesus shows an example of humility, how much more should the disciples do the same? Carrying the notion of example a step further, Jesus invokes the introduction to critical statements that we've seen throughout the Gospels, the Gospel, Amen, Amen, I say to you. This lets the disciples and the readers or hearers of the Gospel know that something very important follows. Jesus continues, A servant is not greater than his master, nor is an apostle greater than the one who sent him. This is a variant of the saying that's found in the Gospel of Matthew at chapter 10, verse 24. Matthew says a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. Both Matthew and John imply that there is an order to society, but that order does not rule out humility as Jesus' example here has just shown. Finally, he says, if you know these things, what he has just been telling him, blessed, fortunate, happy are you if you should do them. Here, there is a double if with a single then. The first if implies that the disciples will come to understand, that is, know these things. That will lead to a state of happiness, blessedness, or fortunateness, designated by the Greek adjective makarios, when they put it into practice, which is the second if clause. The ominous note at the end of the discussion with Peter rears its head again. Jesus says, I do not speak concerning all of you. Then Jesus affirms that he knows those whom he has chosen, and he has done this to fulfill the scriptures. The particular scripture that's fulfilled here is Isaiah 41, verse 9 or verse 10, depending upon the translation. It says, The one who ate my bread has lifted his, ha his heel against me. Sharing bread in the Middle Eastern culture was a sign of friendship. 
and close companionship. Hence, to turn against one with whom you have shared bread is a significant betrayal. Further, to show one the bottom of one's foot in that culture is a sign of contempt. Now, one other point needs to be considered. Excuse the diversion into Greek, but the translation of the Old Testament, known as the Septuagint, cites the word using the text cites the text using the word estheon for eat and artus for bread. The form artus implies loaves of bread. What's cited here uses the word trogon for eat, which was the word used in chapter 6 to designate an undeniable eating of flesh, and the word arton, the singular used for bread, with an article ton, implying a very specific bread. More, more than likely, we have a reference here back to the bread of life, the, discord, the, the Eucharist, which was discussed in chapter 6. Jesus then concludes his interpretation of the act of foot washing of the disciples with an admonition intended to give them insight into events that will occur in the very near future. I say this to you now, before it happens. Jesus knows what's about to happen. He forewarns his disciples so that they might believe when it happens that I am he. Notice the ego a me there. The words that Jesus speaks right now go over the heads of the disciples. But on reflecting on the events, once they have occurred, they will come to know and recognize Jesus' identity. That phrase, ego a me, as we have seen, is an allusion to the divine name. Once the events of the Passion have occurred, the disciples will recognize Jesus as the ego a me, the I am, the sovereign son of God. Then the signal of an important statement comes up again. Amen, amen, I say to you. Then a statement based on the notion of sending, understandable by every good Jew, follows. The agent, the one sent, stands in the place of the sender. Hence, Jesus sends the apostles later in the Last Supper reiterated on Sunday evening. They are to be received as though they were him. The one receiving the one I send receives me. Just as Jesus being sent by the Father as the, should be received as though he was the Father. But the one receiving me receives the one who sent me. This, in reality, is a very ominous note. Jesus was not received as the Father. Instead, he was rejected, ridiculed, and as we shall see, eventually will be killed. That's what the disciples can expect in their mission from Christ. All the talk of not all, and lifting a foot against Jesus, piques the interest of the disciples at whom the person might be. Jesus now unmasks his betrayer. The thought of one of Jesus' disciples being a betrayer troubles Jesus. The Greek verb used is the same as that used in the reaction of Jesus to Lazarus' death in 1133. Hence, we can imply that this is a very deep emotion. Jesus then expresses himself, again with the introductory statement, Amen, Amen, I say to you. And then he announces, One of you will betray me. This causes perplexity among the disciples, who question among themselves, who is it? 
Then the narrator, the narrator gives us a very interesting comment. One of the disciples, the one next to Jesus, which one? The one that Jesus loved. That's the first time that we have a reference to a disciple whom Jesus loved, or the beloved disciple in John's Gospel. So, Peter beckons him to ask Jesus who it is. Here we have a picture of the painting The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. You will notice the disciple to the left of Jesus leaning to another disciple who's speaking. That's Peter requesting that the beloved disciple ask Jesus who the betrayer is. So the beloved disciple asks Jesus, Lord, Kuria, who is it? Jesus answers, that one is the one to whom I dip the morsel and give it to him. Now, this is quite different from the Synoptic Last Supper narrative. There, Jesus says, the one with whom I dip, leaving it a bit up to chance. Here, Jesus dips and gives, thereby naming his betrayer. He is in charge. He is in control, as he will be throughout the entire Passion narrative. Then, Jesus dips, takes, and gives it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Thus is the betrayer unmasked. Then the narrator adds a, a thought of his own. After the morsel, then, Satan entered into him. Thus, this is not Judas's doing. Then Jesus commands Judas to quickly do what he's going to do. The disciples are confused and ask among themselves, why did he tell him that? The narrative ends with a very telling statement. Judas, having taken the morsel from Jesus, departs from the room. He went out immediately. Then a very somber comment. It was night. Judas has now departed from the light and entered into the darkness. Well, that's about all the time we have in this session. Next time, we'll look at the beginning of the great discourse that Jesus gives to his disciples at the Last Supper. That discourse some look at as Jesus' final testament, preparing the disciples for life after he has departed from them. See you then.